Hi, everyone. I uh, just want to say thanks for joining us this morning, and I wanted to give a quick introduction to worship. Um, you'll notice we mix things up a little bit this week. Uh, we do have a full band. However, you'll notice that uh, we're all in different spots. Um, we recorded at different times and in different places. and um, Definitely made it challenging and a bit more work, but uh, I know you guys have all heard Sean talk about um, really liking worship because it's one of the only times that the entire church is united, you know, united in one, one spirit. So... We really tried to capture that this week. We wanted to be united. Even though we aren't physically all in the same location, we wanted to unite and worship God. And so we just want to invite um, all you guys into that. Uh, please join us as we worship. And I just want to let you guys know that even though we're physically distant, we are still here. We are praying for you. And we're only a phone call, a text, or an email, or a message away. And uh, if you need us, reach out and please enjoy. Thank you. Bye.
Church, Pastor Derek here. Just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. We're hearing a lot of great stories about how God's using you out in the world during these crazy times that we live in. And we just wanted to take a moment just to say and remind you that we love you. It's a, an honor and a privilege to join you online each week. And we hope you can join us on Tuesday evenings for the Couples Talk, Thursdays for our Bible study, Fridays for our, our podcast, Sunday mornings, as well as go to our website. When you go to the website, you can click on the children's ministry. And Pastor Tony's been doing devotions for kids and their families to, to join in and just fellowship together around the Word of God and they can grow. And, you know, there's another opportunity. Of course, we're doing things here like the food pantry and helping families in need, giving resources to other churches and different people throughout the community. So if you'd like to be part of that, the radical generosity, we ask that you would give. You can give online at the dansvillefoursquare.org and sign up. You can do that on Facebook, but also you can text 268-1179. It's 585-268-1179. But if you want to drop by and say hi, we can meet you out front. We'll put our masks on, make sure everybody's okay. You can call the church anytime you'd like. We'd love to pray with you or hear what God's doing in your life, or even if you just need to vent. You know, iron sharpens iron. We're here for you. We believe in you. I don't know what I'm doing with my hands right now, but I hope it looks cool. But we love you, and we just want to say thanks. And behind the scenes, if you could just pray for us, right? We're working on the different phases to have re-entry so we can get back together. So pray for our government. Pray for our land to be healed by God. And pray for us that we could have wisdom and discernment to not only take care of our community, but to take care of the body of Christ. We love you, and we'll see you soon. Good morning, everyone. It's certainly nice to uh, be able to get together again and want to say hi to all our friends on Facebook Live and want to say hi to everybody watching on YouTube. Unfortunately, this has kind of become our new norm for now, and uh, and that's okay. Um, I'm Like I've said a hundred times, I'm just glad that we have the resources and abilities and, and technology and tools to, to at least be able to do a service in this way. Uh, around here at the church, uh, we're busier than ever. Things are good. Um, Putting together these services every week obviously has been a challenge, but at the same time, uh, something we really embrace and, and try to bring some inspiration and creativity to it. And uh, we're just really uh, embracing this and enjoying it as much as, you, as we can. Well, this week, uh, we've been doing this COVID thing for far too long in all of our opinions. But uh, I want to let you know that we have a, a four-phase four plan put in place for the reopening of the church. And currently, if you follow New York State guidelines, uh, Livingston County is in the Finger Lakes region. And so Finger Lakes region has hit seven out of seven of the criteria set forth by the governor and all his people and stuff. And uh, that's great news for us um, that that's happened. I think the Southern Tier has hit seven out of seven as well. All that means though, is that we can enter into phase one. And so uh, if you go to the Dansville Foursquare uh, Church website, just dansvillefoursquare.org, uh, you'll see our, our four-phase plan for reopening on there. And you'll see that because of the states uh, setting us at the, at the go level for phase one, that's exactly where we're at. Fortunately, phase one's not a whole lot different than what we've already been dealing with. But it's a beginning of a beginning, and I'm excited for that because we look forward to the day to getting everybody back together. Well, enough of that. I uh, just wanted to give you a quick update that we're working on it, we're anticipating it, we're excited to get back open again. This message this morning, <clears throat> uh, I so enjoyed last week that I decided to do a little bit of team teaching again this week. And so I've asked Pastor Derek and Pastor Tony to join me in coming up with some very practical things that we can do 
to address um, our emotional and spiritual health during this COVID apocalypse, is what I keep calling it. But you know, what are some very practical, biblically driven things that we can do um, that will really help us with our emotional and spiritual health? So the, the key scripture that I have for this is, is found in Romans 12, 11, uh, and 12. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Don't quit in hard times. Instead, pray all the harder. Well, I think that's a, a fair challenge for us. I don't know about you, but I certainly have been feeling burnt out with this whole COVID thing. It's just getting old, right? Uh, and I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, we're just kind of tired of this, uh, the way we're living right now. And I think we're all doing what we got to do, but it can wear you out. And so that's why we wanted to focus on this today. So I'm going to take the first couple ones and share those with you. And I want to give you uh, my key passage for the first one. And that is, start and end each day refueling my soul. Start and each end every day with refueling my soul. The scripture is found in James 1.21. Humbly accept God's word planted in your heart. It is able to save your souls. And the follow-up scripture I have is Psalm 92.2. Every morning, thank God for his love, and every evening, thank him for his faithfulness. Well, that's pretty cool. And so, really, this is a simple thing you can do, but it's easy to, it's easy to ignore and just brush off to the side. But actually taking just a few moments in the morning and spending those moments with God, and, and I'll tell you what I mean by that, and then at night kind of ending your day doing the same thing, just recognizing God. So I actually do do this every day. Um, certainly start my day out with some simple prayer. And then usually I, for the most part, I commit some time in the morning um, to doing a devotional. Now it could be a daily bread devotional, or it could be what I've been doing recently, and that's been reading this book by John Eldridge called Get Your Life Back, Everyday Practices for a World Gone Mad. Uh, this actually came out before the COVID-19. But I've been reading this book. Um, Pastor Derek's been reading it. And no, I don't get any royalties from this book push, but, but I'm enjoying it. And what I do is I just read a chapter a day. I don't go crazy with it, but I read a chapter a day and I really reflect on it. <clears throat> and, I, and I use that to, to reflect on God and to kind of get me started off in a good way. A lot of times, folks, I'm eating a bowl of cereal with some coffee and I'm reading this thing. Or if I don't do it at home, the first thing I do when I come to church is, before I really engage with everybody, of course I get some coffee. But then I come in and I sit down and I read a chapter. And I'll tell you, it does a lot for you. It's that little by little. It um, does so much. And, and it's a great thing to practice. And I really want to encourage you um, to start the day out acknowledging God. Uh, read a little bit of something. A little bit of the Bible or a book or a devotion. There's stuff on your phones, apps, blah, blah, blah. There's so much out there. You really, It's so easy to get access to it. And then... A good practice is when you lay your head down at night for bed, I say a good night prayer. And it's simple. I just thank God for the day. You know, another thing I try to do is I, I try to offload at night when I go to bed. All the problems, all the frustrations, all the things that I've carried throughout the day, you know, I really try to say, God, please help me get some good rest tonight. Let me lay these burdens at your feet, Lord, and give me the the strength uh, to let them go. See, sometimes I think we struggle with that. We don't know how to properly disengage. And I think uh, Jesus taught us that in the scriptures. He knew when to disengage and go up into the mountains for prayer early in the morning, to go away from the crowds. And those crowds just represent the crowds of your life, the busyness, the madness. And you've got to find a way to withdraw and in a healthy way disengage all that and focus on your relationship with God. Okay, here's a riddle for you. What do I crave the most when my guilt is exposed, yet the very thing I'm hesitant to extend when I'm confronted with the guilt of others, especially when their guilt has robbed me of something I consider valuable? Any guesses? It's actually grace. That's right, grace. James 4, 6 says this. Good news, by the way. God loves to give us more grace. He opposes the prideful, but yet he gives grace to the humble. Now you guys have been around, you know I use that scripture all the time. 
I talk about humility and grace a lot. You know why? Because it's fundamental on how to live your life as a Christian. It's a fundamental lifestyle thing, right? Uh, it's an everyday thing. It's, it's, you know, vegetarians eat vegetables. Christians live and in, in, in practice humility and grace every day kind of thing. Uh, and by no means am I endorsing vegetarianism, just for the record. <laughs> I'm not against it either. Please don't send me stuff. I don't, I don't care. Uh, but anyways, this idea of grace. Now, the thing that's interesting to me about grace is, um, the, the, the thing about it is, is the second you think you deserve grace, in essence, you've made yourself unqualified to get it. <laughs> because it's like, uh, it's no different than you trying to uh, plan your own surprise party. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, the very definition of grace is unmerited favor. So it's not something you deserve. It's not something you earn. Uh, grace is not like that. In fact, grace can only be experienced by those who acknowledge they are undeserving. They have to practice humility. It's so important, right? Let me give you a little church history on grace. Um, when we look at church history, the truth is churches that have embraced a, a posture of grace have actually fared really well in church history. But all too often, all too often, you know, the casualty of removing grace for religion and rules and laws slips in. And, it, and it's just a church killer, to be honest with you. That's an absolute church killer. Um, people trade in grace for, for a new set of rules, a new set of laws. You know, I love the Ten Commandments. They're great uh, principles to live by. I have no problem with the Ten Commandments. I, I, they're spot on. Our society is built on these things, our basic laws. But listen to me. The thing is, is laws and rules don't bring you to salvation. You can't follow enough rules to get saved. You can't do it. That's why grace is so important. You've got to acknowledge that my best effort is not going to be good enough. Uh, the scripture even says at one point that our righteousness, our self-man-made righteousness, is like handing dirty rags <laughs> and acting as if they're clean rags. Uh, what an image that is, right? So the essence of grace is unmerited favor. And so we need to practice that and live in grace. I know for me personally, some of the times that I have felt the closest to God and felt really loved by God is when I was the one who needed grace. I didn't deserve it. I was a knucklehead, and I've got a whole logbook of knuckleheaded things I've done over the years. And I'll tell you, when, when grace is given to you, when you're forgiven by somebody or forgiven by God, and you know you don't deserve it, it's one of the most amazing experiences. And, you know, it is humbling when somebody who doesn't have to forgive you, who doesn't owe you the gratitude or the, the, the wherewithal to forgive you, it's not on them to forgive you, and they still choose to forgive you, that's getting to sense God in a real way. So the other thing I want to say is that um, grace, a lot of people say that, well, if that's the case, then we should just, uh, grace covers a multitude of sins and you can just do whatever you want and ask God to forgive you and grace will cover it. And, and they'll term that cheap grace. Ah, I actually find that term offensive. I really do. There is nothing cheap about grace. There's nothing cheap about dying on a cross. Nothing cheap about that at all. Grace is a condition of the heart. That's why the scripture says humility is the key, right? If you're humble, you're not going around sinning on purpose. That's, that's not how that works. Humble is, man, I screwed up. I really made a mess of this. And I, and I need grace. I, I don't deserve it, but I, I need grace. That's how grace works. Now, the last thing I want to hit you with is this. When you've been wronged and things are tough and someone needs grace and you're in a position, of, am I going to be gracious or not? That can be a lot more challenging, right? It can be tough. I always think of it like this. This is my can of WD-40s here, right? All purpose. Everybody should have one of these. If they don't, we all use WD-40. Why? Because without it, things are rusty and crusty, and it's a lot harder to get things to move and flow without some without some lubrication here, and, that, and that's why we have WD-40. And so, to me, when we're talking about grace, it's practiced in the context of relationship. 
And so, yeah, man, to me, grace is like spraying WD-40 all over me, right? And spraying WD-40 on others just helps us, right, to get along better, to glide along better, and, and to make things less less friction and less tension. And it's a choice, you know? You can do it God's way, which I think is much easier, <laughs> or you can do it in a different way. But the truth is... Um, Grace is is incredible. And I think when we apply it, it pretty much handles all of life's problems. But don't forget, it requires humility. uh, And it's not something you earn. It's something you receive. So in these COVID times, practice the lifestyle of grace. Just like a vegetarian is psycho about vegetarian stuff, right? And they can't help but preach to the world about the benefits of being a vegetarian. That's great. I'm all for it. I'm not against it. Right? We need to be like that. We need to live, eat, and breathe grace and humility. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just wanted to share with you maybe a couple more points about um, emotional health, especially during these trying times that we're living in. And two points that we could talk about today is the first one is maybe keeping a simple routine. Right, And it comes from Ephesians 5, and it says, Carefully consider how you live. Live wisely, not foolishly, and making the most of your time because these are difficult, evil days. Now, we can all agree on that, I'm sure. But just to, to think what is wise to do. Is this a wise thing to do? I remember Andy Stanley wrote a book about that, um, the best question ever. And I was getting so frustrated because halfway through the book, he still didn't say what it was. And you get to the middle of the book, and it was, is this the wise thing to do? Should this be wise actions, reactions. And the second point is maybe stop watching so much news or TV or or social media. And it comes from Matthew 6 where Jesus says, um, your eye is a lamp to your body, your vision is good, your whole being will be full of light. But if you are focused on bad, your life will be full of darkness. And also in Psalms 119, keep me from paying attention to what is worthless. Right, so you want to guard your mind, right? So maybe a prayer that we could share together is to have the mind of Christ um, when you're praying over the um, the armor of God, you know, the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith. Control my tongue, Lord, but help me to have the helmet of salvation to protect your thoughts. So it's really parenting your day, your routine, of what goes into your heart and your mind and your soul, and then what comes out of that is a response to your actions. So think of it possibly as parenting. Now, as we move along in these points, I want to do something that I probably shouldn't do, but you guys know I like to get personal a lot. And this past January, I started journaling. And God has been working on me for about two years about rest and uh, Sabbath rest and reading different books. And I'm just really trying to understand in the Ten Commandments why he gave us, uh, in the creation story first, he gave us a day of rest but then keep the Sabbath holy in the Ten Commandments. What exactly does that mean, and how do we apply that in in the year 2020, right? So I'm just going to take a few moments and actually just read out of my own personal journal and just become real with you. And um, wherever the Lord has it land in your heart and your mind, that's totally up to Him, but I hope that it gives you encouragement as you maybe look at my story or my testimony. So on uh, March 27th, I said, Encountering God, it comes from John 17, 20. Um, and through 23. So the restoration of my soul, the healing from my own humanity, so that one heart and one mind with one life, I can have union with God. So my goals were to slow down, to unplug, maybe like a digital detox, to take a pause every once in a while throughout my day, to remind myself or invite Jesus into things, and to enjoy life, you know, love, joy, and peace was the main thrust of actually three out of the four books that I'm reading right now, was to live an abundant life with love, joy, and peace. Um, pray for the right perspective, or the right priorities. And 1 Corinthians 15 shares about the gospel. A couple more points about practicing the pause. I, I touched on that one um, about Easter. It says, your soul will tell you whether or not you're releasing. In the moment after you pray, you find yourself mulling over the very thing you just released, you really haven't released it yet. So we need to pay attention. You know, so what do we do with stress? What do we do with anxiety? You know, we might know the verses, you know, to pray, to pray, to pray, to pray, but what happens when it, it's kind of like stuck in your fingernails and, and you just can't let it go? 
You know, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you process that? Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the ways of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but he delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Right? So maybe, just maybe, to give grace and mercy, not only to yourself, to be kind to yourself, but to be kind to other people. You know, don't fight on Facebook over whether something is a hoax or not or what the church should be doing, or what rights you feel like you may be losing, right? Do we really need to be doing that right now? You know, how, how else, God, can I get rid of my stress and my anger, maybe? You know, are we distracted? How do we embrace and enjoy and maintain the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? How do you embrace this fruit of the Holy Spirit of love and joy and peace? How do I do that? You know, and then I, I took time in my journal to write those things. Um... Efficiency should be how love expresses its why. So think about that, right? If I have the right priorities of love, loving my neighbor as myself, loving God and loving other people, how do I get to do that? Especially during a pandemic, right? We have to get creative. And I hope that the, the online presence we have, even as DFC, can help you with that. Um, we are totally about finding more of God sure you nothing absolutely nothing will bring you more of him than loving him so check that out isn't that wild that how do you get to know god right i wish i would have known this truth earlier especially with my kids because they feel like maybe they're distant or they have their own they don't have their own faith yet or they're still working on that part the way that you get to know god is actually to love him more so as you're doing that as you're loving him more you you get to know him more right so think about your own human relationships you trust somebody to a point, but as you love them more and they love you back, you release more to them. So that would maybe make sense of God, too. The more we love him, the more we can understand about who he is, his character. Um, and then it, it helps us with our mental health. There's a whole bunch of different things I wrote down. Your soul is the vessel that God fills. God made this moment. He made these things. He is the creator of everything I love. So I need to open my heart toward him. So even like if I'm eating a, a favorite food or looking at the... Lately, I've been going over to the deer pond over in Danville by the Rod and Gun Club and just watching the geese. And it's been really cool, the different noises and the smells. I turn the radio off and the car off and just sit there with God, even for five minutes before I come into church or, or whatever. And it says, life is a savage assault on your heart's confidence that God is good. And this is our union with him, so we need to guard our heart. Right? So do you protect your heart and allow the time with the God to, to replenish what you're dealing with and what you're working through and, and how to survive and, and all the different things that we're being faced with? So I go on and on, but the one story I want to leave us with is uh, Mary of Bethany. Right? And we heard this um, on a, a conference call, actually, the president-elect of the Foursquare Church. He talked about uh, Mary of Bethany um, she washed the feet of Jesus with perfume. So her own perfume. So can you imagine like Jesus left the house and he smelled a certain way out of that alabaster jar. And then we'll say Mary left an hour later to go to the market or whatever. And she smelled the same way. And then as people turned, maybe they thought it was Jesus and they looked and they saw that it was Mary. Wouldn't that be cool to, to smell and act and respond like Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walking around, people knew that smell. Was it Jesus or was it Mary? At the death of Lazarus, we also see Mary of Bethany respond. That's her brother, right? If he was there, she's sad. Jesus weeps. He comforts them. He raises Lazarus from the dead. And then we also know Mary and Martha with the housework thing, right? Martha was in the kitchen. Mary was at Jesus' feet. A true disciples sit at Jesus' feet, and we need to do that, especially during these troubling times, these exhausting times, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. We sit at the feet of Jesus, and we have distractions all around us. Can there be balance? How long will it last? So, my friends, as I close my portion of the sermon today, it's really not about finding balance, because I don't know if there is such thing. Jesus was really good at that. He spent a lot of time in prayer. He would go off to a quiet place. He loved the garden, to rest in the garden and spend time with his dad. 
right? But what we're actually seeing from Jesus is that something that I know I want to model and live out, and I hope you do too, is that he had total control of his priorities. So no matter what the world, his flesh, or the devil threw at him, he always kept the main thing the main thing. And I just want to encourage you today as you think about your mental and your spiritual and emotional and financial health to prioritize well, to trust God, invite Jesus into it, and then to look for wise counsel by other believers to help guide and direct your steps, right? And we can do this together. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you in Jesus' name. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me. Um, the first commandment that I get to speak on today is control the controllable and trust God with the rest. And this is a commandment that's about faith, and not just proclaimed faith, but real faith, and that is faith in action. And the, cre the key scripture I would like to start with today is in James. It's James 2, 22. And it reads, You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Now we know the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith, but it also says that faith without works is dead. Now our actions, our deeds, are the proof, they're the proof positive, they're the evidence that we truly believe what we say we do. They're the evidence of our faith. Um, that's a tree that bears fruit. And so I think of my relationship with my wife and my kids, and I could tell them a million times that I love them. I could tell them a hundred million times that I love them. I could scream it from the mountaintops, or I could scream it from a newsroom. But if my actions don't line up with my profession, my profession, if what I profess, if my actions don't line up with my words, then that's not real love. My love isn't really there. I'm reminded of Jesus' parable of the talents, about trusting in our master, believing he is good, and having faith in him. Um, so the first two um, servants, that uh, they get a set of talents from their master, they go out and they invest it. And they both receive varying degrees of success. Or success. Um, but what they take what they were given from God, what they can control, and they, they try to steward it wisely, and then God multiplies it and gives them more. And now this last servant, he takes what he was given and he hides it. He buries it in the dirt. Um, and when he's confronted by the master, he says that he was afraid. He doesn't trust in the master's goodness. And because of it, he is uh, he's sent away. And it's a sad story about wasted life and wasted potential, but it's also uh, a story about a lack of faith, about a lack of trust in the master, so to speak. And so uh, I guess I challenge that if you, if you want to know what you truly believe, then you got to look at your actions. Um, when things get tough and when the rubber meets the road, how do you respond? Do you really trust in God when times are hard? Um, the goal throughout all of this is to have a faith like Job or like Jesus. Um, I love the scripture... Um, What's it? When Job is told by his wife, you know, he's, he's talking about everything that's going on. And his wife goes, just curse God and die. And Job's response is, even if it's he who slays me, I put my trust in him. Or Jesus in the garden where he's about to face crucifixion. And he says, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But where he comes back to is this point of controlling what he can and trusting God the Father and saying, your will, not mine. So as we, you know, we exist in this quarantine and just all the chaos in the world right now and all this upheaval. Um, let's ask God to show us where, our, where to focus our efforts, what we can control and what we should focus on. And um, I pray that we have faith to trust God in, uh, in all the blank spaces. Well, that begs the question, what sort of things can we control or what sort of things should I be focused on right now? And it brings me to our second point, our second commandment. Serve someone suffering more than me. And again, I want to go to James. This time, James 1.27, which says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, this is something as the church we should be doing all the time. It should be kind of our calling card. But in times such as these, this is something that should get kicked into overdrive. Um, this is this should stir life into us. This is a time for us to act and be the light of the, light of the world, as the Bible says. Um, there's a 
interesting story about historians in, uh, in the ancient world around 200 AD. Um, there was a plague that was kind of ravaging the people of Rome at the time. And there were, the historians wrote that they noticed a difference between um, the pagan culture and the, and the Christian culture that kind of coincided at the time and how they treated, um, treated those around them. And so pagans during this plague, um, anytime someone got sick, or died, they would just throw them out onto the streets. You know that life wasn't sacred. Um, they didn't believe that people were created in God's image and had that spark of divinity. Um, so they would just literally throw people out on the streets that were suffering. And now the Christians at the time, I mean, they had a very much different perspective. And even to risk of their own life, they would go outside to get these pagans that weren't, you know, weren't their family and put themselves at risk. And they would bring those people into their homes, or if they were dead, they would give them a Christian burial, burial instead of leaving them in the street. They were treating them with love and respect and dignity. And uh, the historians at the time noted that. They said that it was a huge difference, and it really stood out to them. Um, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, um, and one of the ways that Jesus says that they're going to know we are her disciples, he says this, that they will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. And that really should be our calling card as Christians. Um, I really, really like the story, uh, not the story, but uh, Jesus is washing the feet of his, his disciples. Um, the disciples were the people that Jesus was closest to on this side, uh, on, on, on earth. He spent years traveling with them, doing ministry, laughing, crying, like they were his best friends and his closest confidants. And he knows, he knows he's about to be betrayed. And this is, these are his last moments with those he holds dearest. And how does he choose to, to use them? Um, he, he gets down on his hands and knees and he washes the feet of the very people who should be worshiping and serving him. And he tells them, he says this, he says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Man, he's, he's, he came to serve, and he calls us to do the same. Um, I've been really blessed over the last six weeks or so is we've been able to host the emergency food pantry here, and I've kind of been heading that up. And man, it's helped me feel sane, having something purposeful to do, having something with meaning to help those who need it has really been a, it's been uplifting to me. It's sustained me through all of this. I've, I haven't really had any breakdown moments. I, I've really stayed mentally healthy by having it. And it's, I'm just really glad I've been able to do it. I wish I could express how amazing it's been to see our community donate and come together and really truly help those who need it. And it's been a lot. Um, we've, We've, we've helped over 200 families in our community, and it, it just keeps growing. And it, in true fishes to loaves miracle fashion, we can't seem to give away enough. I mean, we give it and give it and give it, and God keeps providing. You know, it might be top spread and tuna fish, but we're getting fishes and loaves, and, and, and God is good, I guess, so where I'll leave that. But I, I know all of you out there, you might not be able to work at a food pantry or to help out. And, and if you're wondering, how do I how do I make a difference? How do I... How do I live that? How do I control those things? How do I serve those suffering more than me? Um, I really just want to bring up, I know Sean's hit on it several times before, but the, the story of the Good Samaritan. You don't have to look very hard. Um, God will place people along your path. And so what I mean by the Good Samaritan is there was a, a Jewish man who was beaten and robbed and left, on the, left for dead on the silent road. And he saw, I mean, there were religious people that left him, there were Jewish people that left him on that side of the road and just walked past him and left him there. But there was a Samaritan man who happened along that path and saw him and then went and took him to an inn and did his best, you know, paid for his time there and offered, you know, to help take care of him. And so, so I guess the challenge and what I, what I would suggest to do is take a moment and shift your perspective. Um, it's, it's very mentally unhealthy when you're only looking this far in front of your face, where all you see is your problems and your issues and the way things aren't the way you want them to be. So if you could open your eyes to look further ahead and, and open your gaze to see where somebody else is suffering and how you might make a difference, and, and, and I mean that. Pray for God to reveal at least one person, and it can be a neighbor. You can mow their lawn. You can take groceries to somebody who's old, somebody you know who's, you know, it doesn't even have to be financially. You can reach out to somebody you know who's suffering or somebody who's 
who's not doing great, just a text or a message, hey, I love you, I miss you. Like those things mean a lot. They're not inconsequential. They are substantial. So as we close this today, um, yeah, please pray for God to, to reveal somebody in your path. And, and I pray that you have the courage to step out and, and watch how much God blesses you guys on both sides, you and the other person. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you have a great week, and I can't wait to see you guys all in person again. Bye. Good morning, everybody. Um, as you know, it seems to be um, that time where I get to close this, our service out in prayer this morning. So if you'd bow your head and close your eyes and pray with me. Father, we just thank you so much, even for time like this and the things that we're going through, Father. I pray that um, you would refresh our minds and, and renew our minds, Father, as we look to you every day for guidance to what to do and how to handle things and where to go and what to do next, Father. There's just so many things that, and so many um, people with so many agendas that are telling us what to do, Father, but what is most important to us is what you would have for us to do, Father. I pray that... Um, once we go through this week, Father God, that we would remember all the scriptures that um, all the pastors gave to us and how to just keep our minds sharp and how to focus on you and, and how to stay positive in a world that seems to be so negative. Father, we give you praise and honor and thank you so much for being with us and loving us through everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Haske ya china sara akanduhu ke kuan rayuwa ko watafito dagaduhu Nasa mo haske ayo, Yesu yabani haske ayo.